Hello friend, thanks for joining me for another book chat. Today let's talk about some history. The Scythians, Nomad Warriors of the Steppe by Barry Cunliffe. This was originally published back in 2019. And this is the second book by Barry Cunliffe that I have read and chatted here on my channel. I previously read By Step, Desert, and Ocean by Cunliffe, and I enjoyed that a lot. I will link to that chat down in the details below. I'm interested in this topic. Other books on this topic that I've read and chatted are Empires of the Silk Road by Christopher I. Beckwith and The Horse, the Wheel, and Language by David W. Anthony. Yes, obviously, I have an interest in the history of the Eurasian steppe. So, yeah, what's this one about the Scythians? So, this book is part history, part archaeology, and part art history. So, there's a lot packed into not a very big book, but very beautifully published with lots of illustrations. It's great for this reason. It's really great for visual learners because there are tons of descriptive maps as well as like pictures of all sorts of examples of their art and culture. And I'll show you a few of these as we go along in this chat. So the Scythians, I wasn't too familiar with them. The civilization, hence my interest in reading this book. Although, you know, I've seen them referenced in other, other works over time. And I had seen some videos with examples, particularly of their art. Uh, here, and I'll, I'll show some more of that here in a bit. But before we get too into this chat, I did just want to clarify that I am a general reader. I am not a historian, and I'm not an authority on the Scythians, so I am not teaching. Uh, this video is not about teaching anybody that anything particular about the Scythians. It's really just my experience in reading this book. So having said that, Let's get into it. So who were the Scythians? They were a nomadic warrior culture that flourished in the Eurasian steppe for about six or seven hundred years from about 750 BC until about 200 BC. There's a quote here that says the division of the Scythian period into three early or archaic from 750 to 600. This would be BC middle from 600 to 400, and then late from 400 to 200, followed by the Sarmatian period, broadly contains the archaeological evidence. So I'm going to explain a little more about how we know about the Scythians at this point. So about 200 BC, the movement of other peoples, including Celtic people, into the region brought the Scythians as such to an end. And I just thought this was really fascinating in the book because they had this long history and they had spread out over a large part of the steppe. Their culture was very widespread, but they weren't really displaced or destroyed by any other people or civilization. Others had moved into their area. But from what I gathered from the book, it was more of a matter of the new interaction with the newcomers the Scythians evolved then into being something else. There's a quote here that, that sort of illustrates that. While the Celtic presence can be recognized in the archaeological record, the actual immigrants were probably not numerous, and it is better to regard the Bastarne as a cosmopolitan mix of Celts, Gerte, and Scythians, who were strong enough by the beginning of the 2nd century, century BC to halt the advance of the Sarmatians. So it was that by about 200 BC, the Scythian world was at an end. All things come to an end, right? <laughs> uh, but let's look back at the beginning of the Scythians. So in about 4800 BC, the first evidence of horse domestication appears. Horses, of course, originate in the Asian steppes. And the book says an increase in population and a more mobile form of pastoralism, the horse, that led in turn to the development of a strongly hierarchical society with powerful leaders able to command the allegiance and resources of increasingly large groups of followers. Invigorating it was all was the horse, providing mobility, speed, and facility for men to work together as a horde. Humans had learned from their horses how to become herd animals. 
The book goes on to say, it was the interaction of these complex factors coming together at the beginning of the first millennium BC that created the conditions for the emergence of highly mobile predatory nomad hordes. Out of this melee, the Scythians were born. So we talked a bit about where, when the Scythians lived, but where did they live? So they lived in an area, well, in a very broad area, but roughly it was an area north of the Black Sea, roughly where the Ukraine is now, uh, although it's a much bigger area than the present day Ukraine. So I just got a couple of maps here to show. Not sure you'll be able to tell on this video, but this is the Black Sea right here, and this is the Caucasus Mountains, and this is where the original Scythians, uh, they, 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 they migrated from more Central Asia to this area here on the Black Sea, around the Black Sea. And I got another map here that shows us uh, here, this is the Black Sea. This is north of the Black Sea. This is showing settlements, uh, Scythian settlements here. So, you know, really interesting and really helpful maps in this book. The Scythians did not write. So what we know about them mostly comes from other cultures, many times their enemies. Primarily early on, this was the Greeks who had colonies in the area where the Scythians uh, were settling. And this was really interesting to me because I did not really realize how many colonies the Greeks had. This is a map of the Greek colonies. This is, again, the Black Sea, and you can see all the little black dots all the way around the sea. These are all Greek colonies. Um, I didn't really realize there, had, there were so many Greek colonies and in this area. The Greeks seem to have a, had a pretty good relationship with the Scythians. I mean, you know... <laughs> It came and went, and they considered them barbarians, but uh, the, the, primarily the slaves. So there was a slave trade between the Scythian elites and the Greeks, and the Scythian slaves were really highly valuable. And as a matter of fact, they were the uh, eventually uh, in uh, they were the police force, like in the fifth century, they were the police force of Athens. There were these publicly owned slaves that were the police. I thought that was extremely interesting. Um, but another way that we know about the Scythians, rather than other than just uh, writings of their enemies or other people, is through the is through archaeology, archaeological research, specifically their Kurgan burials. So they have these big circular Kurgans. They're like little they're like tombs, and they're wooden. They're sunk in the ground. And then there's this mound of earth over them, and amazingly, lots of these survived into like the pres basically the present day because of the the climate is so cold that the timbers were more or less preserved and some of them have been robbed and some hadn't uh, uh, amazingly so there's just this treasure trove of archaeological evidence from these kurgans and i have some examples here this is one that was excavated i believe in the 80s and you can tell this is the this is the a couple here. You can't really tell about the curtain because they've, of course, they're excavating it, so they've removed it. And then I have another uh, one here that is um, showing what it would look. This is a drawing of it. So here's the mound, and here's the shaft down here, the chamber down below, and how things were laid out in the chamber. So extremely interesting. I thought it was just fascinating. So this was a hierarchical war warrior culture, as I mentioned. So you might expect that they, are, they were somewhat violent. And the Greek historian Herodotus and others really describes their, their practices. And they are, they do seem quite, uh, quite uh, harsh to us today. They beheaded their, uh, their enemies when they killed them. They would behead them and, and scalp them and uh, apparently keep the scalps as sort of trophies as well as sometimes the skin of the victims got made into other objects. And so, you know, that was kind of <laughs> creepy. But then skulls, if there's a, like a particularly detested enemy, sometimes with like a family feud, a uh, particularly des detested enemy that's killed, their skull might be made and in, fashioned into a drinking cup, Herodotus says. So <laughs> I thought that was also kind of gruesome. And then with the death of a king, there was this ceremony of... Now, they're in the steppe, so it's, the ground's frozen a lot of the years. So especially if they couldn't build the Kurgan right away, 
but nevertheless, they, they, they carted the king around to all the different settlements uh, of which he had overseen. And well, as they, the procession came into the, the area, the people would like slash their foreheads, slash their arms, uh, stab their hands with arrows, notch their noses, flick off part of their ear. And then at the burial itself, Sometimes people would cut off parts of their own body to put in with the Kurgan. So like, for example, fingers have been found from multiple people inside the Kurgan. So uh, just very, you know, very unique sort of uh, a bit gruesome, but also a unique culture that they had around this sort of practice. They're kind of brutal. So the hemp tent. So I did want to bring up the hemp tent uh, because at the, at the burial, as sort of the final process of a royal burial, they had this hemp tent. This doesn't have the tent around it, but it was this tripod thing. And down here's a fire. They put hemp seeds on it. And then this is surrounded by like a cloth. And then you stick their head in and breathe in those fumes, those hemp fumes. And I, I thought that was kind of interesting and fun. Um, I wanted to show, before I run out of time, a little bit about the art and some of the other cultural artifacts, because this book is just loaded with pictures. This is a shield thing, um, and they just had this fa fascinating art, very skilled in metalwork, especially. Let me just pull up a couple of those to show. Um, here is, uh, this is a plaque, and a, this is a bridle from a bridle, like from a horse. Isn't that gorgeous? And this is a plaque. It's gorgeous work there. And let's see here. Got another one. You might recognize some of these. So I've seen these, like this reclining uh, deer here. See that? Gorgeous. Um, and their art kind of looks kind of Celtic, right? And there's some similarities with cultural exchange, I think, among with them and the Celts. But just gorgeous uh, here. Uh, stuff and then I got a picture I wanted to show of of uh, clothes like the uh, a Scythian armor. This is what a Scythian armor. This comes from reconstructed from a find in one of the Kurgans, one of the burial tombs. Finally, uh, tattoos. It was very common to tattoo. Here's drawings of a man tattooed his tattoos that he had on. This is from an actual body that's been found in a Kurgan. Uh, very elaborate in the legs, arms, chest, back. Uh, very cool. So yeah, this book was so much fun to read. And it was just, like I said, just chock full of illustrations, examples of the art, maps. So very easy to read and very enjoyable for me to delve a little bit into the history of the Scythians. Okay, I think I'll leave that chat there. And my next chat, I will switch over back into some fiction. I am going to chat about The Book of Form and Emptiness by Ruth Ozeki. And I will have a chat on this coming up very soon. So until next time, take care.